Good morning and welcome to Ainsdale Evangelical Sunday Service. We'd like to start off with some scripture. This morning's scripture is Psalm 100. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. And our first song is All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
holy, Lord God Almighty.
Let's pray, shall we? <laughs> Father, we thank you that we can gather here and look at your word. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a desire and love for your word and an understanding as well. Father, we pray that you will open the scriptures to us this morning, Lord, and you will bless us through that, Father. And in that, you will be lifted up and glorified and praised and worshipped. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay, so uh, 1 Samuel 18, we'll begin in verse 1. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armour, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the same displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have for the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day. But the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, so at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but he had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him a captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. And Saul said to David, Here is my other daughter Merah. My older daughter, I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So David said to Saul, who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at the time when Merah, Saul's daughter, would have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Mahothelite as a wife. Now Mekah, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David the second time, You shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants, Communicate with David secretly, and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servant spoke these words in the hearing of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry, but one hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul fought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistine. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David arose and went. He and his men had killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and he gave them in full count of the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal's daughter as a wife. Then Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, 
and Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was, whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. So we see at the beginning um, that Jonathan and David formed this wonderful friendship, this uh, very close bond, and we really like brothers. David said that, that after he died, Jonathan, that Jonathan's love was sweeter, sweeter to him than a woman. So there was really this incredible bond between the two. And after that, of course, David lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's not true, is it really? Um, Saul, after this incredible blessing, it said that Saul, uh, verse 8, Saul was very angry. Um, so, um, Saul said in verse 11, I will pin David to the wall with this javelin, but David escaped twice. Um, in verse 12 it says, Saul was afraid of David. Uh, Saul removed him from his presence and uh, he eventually tried to get the Philistines to kill him in battle. Um, he saw that David behaved wisely, he was afraid of him. And in verse 29 he said, Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. So after this uh, wonderful blessing that he received, David, his life uh, wasn't all sweetness and light, was it? He, in fact, he was a man of many, many troubles. Um, the king and actually loved Saul, didn't he? He was very loyal to Saul, and he, and he loved Saul, and he was always a faithful servant to him. There was multiple times where. Uh, he could have killed Saul and taken the kingdom himself, but he chose never to do that. Uh, and I think actually he, he, he killed the people who eventually run Saul through because he said, you know, what, how dare you stretch out your hand against the king's anointed? That was the love and the faithfulness that he had for Saul. But uh, even so, Saul's hand was against him, it says, continually. And uh, David, if you, if you read through all, all of the scriptures, David had many, many, many troubles in his life. Of course, all the trouble with Saul, uh, the, the Philistines, he had uh, big trouble with Bathsheba, didn't he? He uh, sinned, really, sending out Uriah the Hittite to be killed so that he could have um, Bathsheba as his wife. And consequently, the child died. Uh, David was before the Lord, was only seven days. Praying and seeking the Lord that the child might live, but eventually the child died. Um, and of course, uh, David was in, in mourning, and he had problems later on with his son, uh, Amnon, uh, who it's a, uh, fell in love or possibly lusted after his sister Tamar. And um, he, he took her by force, and uh, that was his half sister. And her brother Absalom uh, hated him for this and eventually um, killed him. So this obviously displeased David. David was uh, a great sadness over his son, and then Absalom, probably because of this, rebelled against David, and there was uh, war. Uh, David actually had to go to, to war against his own son, and, and when he died, Absalom, David was destroyed, absolutely destroyed, even though he won uh, the battle and defeated his enemy. His enemy was a, his own son. So David was a, a, a very, uh, Troubled man, very blessed man as well, but a man who had lots of troubles in his life uh, and he, he made mistakes as well, of course. Back Bathsheba, um, he, he numbered Israel as well. Um, and it said that 70,000 uh, Israelites died because David had numbered Israel. So he was um, uh, not perfect in his actions, he, he made many mistakes, uh, uh, sinning, but even so, God said that his heart was perfect. In 1 Kings 11, verse 4, it says, It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, as was the heart of David his father. <coughs> so Solomon's heart was turned away after other gods. Um, but it says that David's heart was perfect. Although he made many mistakes, he sinned. God considered his heart to be perfect. There's not many people in the scriptures that it says that about, but it says it of David, despite his mistakes. Um, 
So, so David was a man of uh, many trials, really, tribulations. Um, and so it is with the Christian, isn't it? That our life is not always smooth sailing. Uh, this guy in America, Joel Osteen, the money preacher, he wrote a book called Your Best Life Now. And, um, <laughs> it's, it's not really scriptural, is it? You look at David's life, um, you know, whose heart was perfect with God. Joel Osteen, who is you know, he's incredibly smug, isn't he? But he's, he's very smooth, sort of suave guy. Um, he said, no, David, you've got it all wrong. All you need to do is read my book, which is 1599 or whatever, and you'll live your best life now. There's a, there's a guy that I've listened to now and then in the States, I think he, he's a rapper, he does rap music. I don't think it's a, it, it's not very good, usually Christian rap music, so it's not something I listen to often. But he's done a few really good songs, and he says in one of his songs, um, if you're living your best life now, you're headed for hell. And that's, that seems like a sort of a clear throwaway line, doesn't it? When you think that through, you think, well, actually, there's a lot of truth to that, isn't it? If your life is never going to get better than the life you've got now, if this is the best you've got, you've got no hope. That's a, that's a scary prospect. So I thank God that we're not living our best life now. And although this life is good, isn't it? There's a lot of bad things, but the life that we've got, the, the Lord Jesus Christ has promised us, that's good news this morning, isn't it? So, let's look at uh, John chapter 15. John 15, verse 18. Uh, Jesus speaking, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, remember, the world hates you. But uh, our life as Christians is often not plain sailing. Uh, John 16, 33. Uh, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be, be of good cheer, I am with you. 1 John 3, verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. These are salutary words, aren't they? But the life of the Christian is, is not always plain sailing. Um, we're told, actually, don't expect it to be. Don't expect the world to love you. We, I think we sometimes think the world should love us, don't we? Because we're you know, decent, upstanding, honest people. Um, you know, we, we love God. Um, and, you know, we, we treat people, you know, do unto others as we have done unto yourself. We live by these words, don't we? And because of that, we expect the world to, to love us. We shouldn't. Jesus says, you know, Mark. John said, marvel not if the world hates you. And, um, you know, Jesus said, you, you're not of this world. Now I've chosen you out of this world. Don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first. And that's what it is, isn't it? That's why if the world hates us, it's because it hates Jesus. So, we look at all the, the troubles that David had, and there were many. And we think of our world today, what trouble have we got in the world today? I don't know if anyone's following what's going on in Australia, but it's not good news. There's lots of trouble there. <clears throat> you know, we've seen the, the army on the streets, the police, extremely heavy-handed, and it's, um, it's, it's developing into a very nasty situation. And it, the question is, is, it, is that you know, for our country? It's a Commonwealth country, the Queen is the head of state. May that happen here? I don't know, it's, but it's possible. We're seeing uh, mandates for the jab. But, uh, that's, they're trying to bring that in for the NHS. Now, the NHS is an enormous employer in this country. Mm -hmm. So if they can get that many people under a mandate, that sets a precedent. And does that expand from there? I don't know. I hope not. 
or I hope if it does, we will be gone by then. But that's um, just to say that you know there's lots of bad news out there. This this um, uh, the, the passports being uh, put out there. People are saying, oh yeah, we want these passports. They've got them in Israel. Um, you know, are you going to have to? The phrase I've got, have you got to get poked to get yoked now? Have you got to get the jab to go to church mm. and serve the Lord? Mm. That's, is that, I don't know if that's the phrase they come out, they'll come out with in the end, get poked to get yoked. I hope not. Uh, I hope we don't hear any more of that. But, but needless to say, there's lots of trouble here, isn't there? In this world, there's loads of trouble. Um, and as we get closer to the time of the end, we would expect actually an uptick in problems, wouldn't we? Uh, as things uh, degenerate and, and, and the system that's going to come in to replace uh, our current systems is, is rolled out. So there's plenty of troubles. The question is, how did, uh, how did David come up with his troubles? Because he was a man of, of troubles and sorrows, but he got through them. And the question is, uh, what happened to him? And if we go back to uh, 1 Samuel 18, uh, we look at verses 1 to 4. And it says, you Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. And David and Jonathan made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave, gave it to David with his armour, even to his sword and to his bow and his belt. And uh, I think we can look at this as a, as a small picture of uh, Christ, his love for us, and what Jonathan did for David is in some small measure a glimpse of what Christ has done for us. It says that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. If we look at John 15 9. Uh, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And that's quite a small statement, but there's an enormous um, weight in that statement that's really very difficult to comprehend, I find. Jesus is telling us, as God the Father, it says that God is love. Christ of love, as he loved the Son who was absolutely perfect and, and spotless and without sin flaws, as the Father has loved Jesus, Jesus has loved us, he's loved us in the same way. So the way that um, Jonathan's soul says was knit with David in the same way but more so actually Jesus' soul has become knit with ours isn't it? because he loves us so much it's, words cannot convey it my mind cannot comprehend it but i accept that it's true I, I can't possibly convey it to you today but it's telling us that as god the father loves the son that's how jesus loves us mm. so we've got that wonderful picture um, of uh, jonathan and his soul being knit to david that's just a small measure of how Christ loves us. That's how he was able to go to the cross and endure all the pain and the suffering. And, you know, people spitting at him, mocking him, whipping him, crowns of thorns, the whole, the whole uh, gamut. It was because he loved us. He wanted the Father's glory and he was thinking of us and how much he loved us and how he was going to redeem us from our sins. Verse 3, it says, uh, Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Let's look at Hebrews 2. Hebrews 12, rather. Verse 2.
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's the wrong verse, actually. <laughs> it says he's the mediator of the new covenant that he's made in his own blood, essentially. So as Jonathan and David made a covenant, Jesus has made a covenant with us. And I'm not sure what they sealed their covenant with, perhaps just their word and their bond, I don't know. But in the old days, they would do it through the blood of animals, wouldn't they? But Jesus did it through the animals. That's, um, that's how far he was prepared to go for. That's how much he loved us. That he would uh, make us make a new covenant with us in his own blood. Um, and John uh, John six thirty seven says, "All the Father gives me shall come to me, and he that comes to me I will in no way cast out." So there's a certainty there, isn't there? That Jesus is. Absolutely sure he's saying, whoever comes to me, there's no way I'll ever, I'll never kick them out. I will pay for their sins, I will redeem them, and I will take care of it. And I'm, I will never reject anyone, anyone who comes to Jesus truly, and, and faithfully, and really puts their trust in him, will never, ever discard them. The same way we saw Saul and Jonathan making covenant, Jesus has made that covenant with us. He's promised, and it says He who promised is faithful. And it says also it's it's not possible that God should lie. And that's very comforting to me. God cannot lie, and it says He who promised is faithful. In Revelation, He's called faithful and true. He's absolutely reliable, and His covenant is sure. It will stand forever. And because of that. We will live forever. <clears throat> and verse 4, it says, Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armour, even to his sword and his bow. <coughs> so Jonathan essentially held nothing back from David. We see this son of a great king who's held nothing back from David, he's, he's taken off his glory, hasn't he? If you're the son of the king, you're not dressed like us here today, although Barbara looks very nice. Barbara's dressed up. We just look okay, don't we? But if you're the son of the king, you look majestic, don't you? You've got silk or whatever it is, you know, you've got the finest clothes on if you're the son of the king. But they, uh, Jonathan said, no, 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 I will give that up. And uh, if we look at he, uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So it said that Jesus was in the form of God. He was on the throne, wasn't he? He was highly exalted in heaven. But he said, I'm going to lay my glory aside. In the same way that Jonathan did, he took off all of his glorious robes. Jesus did the same, he stepped down, discarded his glory, humbled himself, and for us, he went to the cross. It says that he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which is the worst death imaginable, isn't it? It's not just any death. It's the worst death that anyone could possibly contemplate. And his glory meant nothing to him. He, he gave no thought to give it up. In the same way, Jonathan, he, he said he, he gave him his girdle, his bow, his sword, everything. He just gave him everything. And that's what Jesus has done for us. Um, it's, 
says uh, in Revelation, doesn't it, that the saints will have white robes. And that's the righteousness of Christ, isn't it? It's not. There are some uh, new translations that have butchered it that says it's the righteousness of saints, as if it's something they've earned, but it's not. It's the righteousness of Christ that he's imputed to us. Where Jonathan gave uh, David his, his princely robe, Jesus has given us his righteousness that one day we will stand in white robes. But there was a cost, wasn't there? It says in uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, he, he bore our sins in his own body. That actually Jesus was in some way defiled, wasn't he, by our sins. He took them in his own body. It's, it's more than uh, Jonathan did. You know, the, the, the equivalent humanly, I suppose, would be to, for him to walk and win the mud and cover himself in filth. That's what Jesus did. He covered himself in our sins. Took, it says, took, took bore them in, in, in his own body. It says, he who knew no sin became sin. It says, the, the just for the unjust, doesn't it? That great substitutionary atonement. That he can get our sins and pay for them. And we will get his righteousness. As uh, Jonathan loved David and gave him his robe. Uh, gave him that honour. That he would uh, look something like himself. He would look like a prince. Jesus Christ has taken off his, his uh, glorious robes of, of his glory in the heavenly places and he's given us his, his white robes, his righteousness that we may go in to the uh, married supper of God and as I say he took his sins, our sins in his own body and he paid the ultimate price on the cross um, and it says that was the Scripture that I wrote down incorrectly, uh, Hebrews 12 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. So it was something that Jesus despised, and, and rightly so, that he was righteousness itself, and he was took all of, took all of our sins, was sullied by all of our sins and our filth. But he did it, although he despised it, he endured it, went to the cross and, and he paid it all in full. Paid it in full. Um, and then we see in uh, 1 Samuel 18 verse 2, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. If we look at John 14,
but it's it's this um, what Christ has done to us that we need to remember. As uh, Jonathan loved David, so Jesus has loved us, but more so. Mm. And he's taken off his uh, his kingly garments, he's given them to us, <coughs> and he's gone to prepare a place for us. So when the world uh, gets darker, we need to look up and trust that he's coming back for us soon. And we're not living our best life now. We've got a far better one to come. And the Lord bless you. And our last song is more and more about Jesus.